Hello, I am exhausted. I am super tired because yesterday was my stepson's birthday. So we did all of the birthday activities. We went to Dave and Buster's and then we came back here and we did homemade cake and ice cream. I made ice cream. And then in the evening we did, um, with his cousins, we did, uh, cookout outside where we did hobo pies which matt had told me about i we had some the other day just matt and i had them but we did them for the kids last night and um it's there's like this cast iron sandwich maker and you put the bread and the insides inside of it and it squishes them and then you put it in the fire and then um sort of the edges the crust comes off and it, and it forms a seal that's why they call it a pie and you take it out you can put anything you want in there you can do sweet or savory so for savory stuff you do like just a ham and cheese and it melts the cheese and it's really good for uh sweet you can do nutella and bananas that's really good so we did that last night and then the cousins slept over. It was fun. We did a really good job, but it was exhausting. So I'm a little tired today. Mission accomplished. Incidentally, I was thinking today, last year for my stepson's birthday, uh, we had a bunch of plans. I think they went to Chuck E. Cheese's. I was supposed to go, but I wasn't feeling well. And I had said this whole thing where you have to wear masks is ridiculous if you're not sick and you don't have to do all this stuff if you're not sick. But I was like, I'm sick. I have some sort of cold and I don't think it's COVID, but I'm not feeling well. So we agreed that I would stay home. Well, the next day I tested positive for COVID. So it was right around my stepson's birthday that I caught it. And then I was very, very sick for a couple of weeks last year at this time, but not like that now. I actually feel really good. The weather has been gorgeous. It's been mid seventies. So we have been taking advantage of that. Although and it was really great yesterday for the birthday and then for doing the fire and stuff. Cause it was like in the upper fifties in the evening. So it was really nice for that. How are you? I would like to see some of the comments that you've got and we can chat for a minute. Fiery Waco is contemplating drinking stuff. I think you should go for it. Why not? Do it. Fiery Waco is telling Super Soda Jerk who missed the show last week because he didn't get the notification. Fiery Waco is saying, um, it's the same time every week, dude. It's the same time every week. Pretty much. Yeah. It's been a while since I've deviated from the time. So there are times when I don't have it but then I announce it. So you would see that hopefully. And if I get uh, a strike or something and I can't do it, it's still going to be on Rumble and it's still going to be on Entropy and DLive. So strikes on YouTube will not stop me. Uh, Agorizer says, hey, perpetrators. Hello there. It's good to see you. Incidentally, I don't know whether I mentioned this, but Matt and I are running for our local village council. To be honest, I kind of didn't want to run, but Matt wanted me to run and his reasoning was dead on. He says, you know, if we want the country to be better, we shouldn't just prep and run off. We should, we should try to run for local office. And there's been a lot of conservative Patriot YouTubers who have said that, you know, Styx is one of them, but a lot of other uh, YouTubers have said that as well or alternative media that we start with the local offices and we kind of have a duty to try and save it. Maybe it can't be saved, but we should try. And the best way to do that is to run for local office. So I kind of didn't want to run, but when Matt said, we need to step up, I was like, yeah, you're right. Now I'm kind of glad that we did because even though I still, I still don't want to serve, I will serve and I'll be good at it and I'll take my duty seriously. But, um, our uh, opponents are all in favor of raising taxes and they actually just come out and say it. I've been a little shocked at how brazen they are at saying, yeah, we're going to raise your taxes. In fact, the guy who's running against Matt for village council president, which is kind of like mayor, he just, he says in an article, he says, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to raise taxes as much as the people can stand. He doesn't use those exact words, but that is the sentiment he says. He says, we need to increase our revenue. There's a certain point at which the people won't tolerate it anymore. And I'm like, so what you're saying is you're going to raise taxes as much as they can tolerate or as much as they can stand. It's just, it's shocking how brazen they are. It's shocking how brazen they are. So Matt and I are the only non-incumbents running. Everybody else is running for re-election. 
Like if we weren't running, it wouldn't even be in the papers because it'd be like, well, it's just a, it's a fait accompli. Everybody who's there just stays on. And it's for like another four years. So we're running, we're making a race of it. But even if both of us get on, we can't outvote the other members. There's only two of us. And it's a six member council, including the, the president. So we are running for that. We're doing our part. We're trying. And uh, I will give you updates on that in two weeks, two and a half weeks when we have the election. So Rick Bourne says, sound like you could crush your political opponent in a debate. Well, we don't really do debates for the local village stuff. There's, there would be no venue to do it. But what we can do is just honestly take the newspaper where the other opponent, where really all of us were interviewed, they sent us questionnaires and we responded to them. Just take that with us as our plan and show people what the opponent said. He just comes out and says it. I'm going to raise your taxes and show that to people. And um, I think that'll work because people around here, we have really high taxes in this local area compared to the other local areas. And um, people are pissed off about it. Anyway, uh, Rational Wrong Thing says Winnie the Pooh has said he's going to take Taiwan. We will get to that in a little bit. That is one of the most important stories that I'm doing tonight. But then uh, it's part of the, the title that I have here. But actually, what I am going to begin with, and I am going to get to uh, entropy after we do this, but it's a good lead in. What I'm going to start with is what is going on over in the UK. I gotta get my little earphones on. I used to try to do it without the earphones, but I need to listen to what's going on. Liz Truss has resigned, becoming the shortest serving prime minister in British history. And our country has been held back for too long by low economic growth. I was elected by the Conservative Party with a mandate to change this. We delivered on energy bills and on cutting national insurance. And we set out a vision for a low-tax, high-growth economy that would take advantage of the freedoms of Brexit. I recognise, though, given the situation, I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was elected by the Conservative Party. I have therefore spoken to His Majesty the King to notify him that I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. This morning I met the chairman of the 1922 committee, Sir Graham Brady. We've agreed that there will be a leadership election to be completed within the next week. That's fast. They're going to do it next week. This will ensure that we remain on a path to deliver our fiscal plans and maintain our country's economic stability and national security. I will remain as Prime Minister until a successor has been chosen. Thank you. So Liz Truss, I don't know that she's 100% responsible for the fiasco that was her administration. She, she made some errors. But she was also, well, let's begin with what's not her fault. She was handed a very bad situation, which is the entire global economy is about to collapse. The United States has been raising interest rates, which has been suppressing foreign currencies. Uh, the interest rate increases in the U.S. have also been uh, having a very negative impact on the Japanese yen, not just the British pound. There's a lot of other currencies that are really suffering because of, of that increase. So she walked into already a very difficult financial, financial situation. There was already really high inflation in the UK. The energy bills were out of control and a very serious, very deep recession was imminent. They have an energy crisis. So she walked into a very bad situation to begin with. And then her plan, along with her chancellor of the exec, I can't say exec, whatever, the, the treasury secretary, he was saying, uh, the two of them together came up with a plan to cut taxes to corporations, or really what they were doing was uh, eliminating a planned increase on corporate taxes, and they were cutting taxes to the wealthy. Now, 
normally I think that would have worked. Normally that does stimulate the economy. That, that was actually what Trump did during his administration. The problems with it are in the very immediate term, if it doesn't, if it doesn't work the way that you think it will, then you're just going to get less revenue. And if you're already having budget problems, it's going to deepen your budget crisis. That is the risk of doing it. So even though it worked for Trump, and when Trump was going to do it, I was I was saying this is going to get us deeper into debt, and then the U.S. is still getting deeper into debt, but it did stimulate the economy exactly as he said it would. Um, but this is different economic times right now in the world than it was just a couple of years ago. So one of her mistakes was not realizing that. And I think also the sort of way of looking at things in Europe and in the UK may be a little different from how it is in the US. So a lot of the investors in the UK said, this is going to cause a budget crisis and it caused them to lose faith in the government bonds. So it's kind of almost an emotional thing. It's not that it immediately, not that the any budget shortfalls caused defaults, but people thought this endangers the UK of defaulting on its bonds. So it scared people, it gave them the jitters, and then they started selling off their bonds and it caused uh, part of the, the crisis, which was deepened by what I discussed last week uh, regarding if you are doing a bond fund, and then even if you think you want to hang on to your bonds and ride this out, because everybody else is selling, you kind of have to, so that makes the problem worse. But what initially caused the run on the bonds was that people were concerned that this budget shortfall was going to cause the UK to default on its uh, on its bonds. So that happened. I think even though the plan in a different situation might have worked, it didn't work now for the reasons that I stated. This is a very different economic climate than it was just a couple of years ago. And I think the economic sort of sentiments or views of looking at things in Europe are different than they are in the US. So a, a couple of things happened there. And then um, I think she probably fired her secretary of the treasury too quickly and that scared people. It, it looked very unstable. And then her home secretary quit, which also increased the appearance of instability in her government and then finally she just had to quit so she's gone or right now she's still there she has to stay on until they get somebody new and they're replacing that her very very quickly they're going to replace her next week i am going to read your comments but i want to talk about the replacement first and then i'll look at them we'll sort of finish up the story so who's going to be replacing her? And there's another number of people that they're looking at. This is an article from the New York Post. Who could replace Liz Truss as the next UK Prime Minister? Now, the who is the Prime Minister of the UK? That is going to be significant for global politics because the UK still is very important internationally. It's one of the G7 countries. The humiliating end Thursday of Liz Truss's historically short UK leadership sparked frenzied speculation over who will replace her, with some even predicting a return of her doomed predecessor, Boris Johnson. Now, here's why I think Boris Johnson is likely to be the pick. He already knows the job. People are familiar with him. There may be things about him that he doesn't like, but they know he understands the job and he's not going to have kind of the, the craziness that happened with Liz Truss. It's, it's going to bring back stability to have that familiarity of somebody, even if you don't like him that much, it still brings stability to put back in the guy who who is familiar with the job and you might not like how he does the job but he knows how to do it and he's been uh, a figure in british politics for a very long time so i think with the craziness of what happened during the list trust administration uh, administration people are really going to want some stability and they're going to they're going to grit their teeth and just say bring him back even if they don't like him, they're like, just bring him back. He'll, he'll restore stability to the government. So that's why I think it's probably going to be him. I don't know. We'll see. 
Truss only entered 10 Downing Street as the Conservative Party's pick on September 5th, with her resignation after just 44 days in office, Thursday making her the shortest serving leader in British political history. What a shit show. What a catastrophic failure. I kind of feel bad for her. I feel sorry for her. She leaves with her ruling Conservative Party more divided than ever with and no obvious replacement in her wake. That makes the leadership battle rife for gamblers eager to make back some of the hard-earned cash they lost due to Trust's disastrous e economic policies. Here are the top five favorites, according to political pundits and bookies alike. Rishi Sunak. Now, if you'll recall, I talked about this before. This was her main opponent before Liz Truss was uh, elected by her party, was Rishi Sunak was the guy um, opposing her. Britain's former finance minister was the runner-up to Truss in the previous leadership battle and the current favorite, according to online bookmakers Betfair. So uh, the bookmakers think that it's going to be uh, Rishi Sunak. He has long been one of those the most popular candidates among conservative lawmakers at Westminster, with many praising him for warning of previous economic crises that befell the UK. Others, however, blame him for some of the financial policies that ultimately led to Truss's downfall. Many members of Parliament also blame Sunak for bringing down once popular PM Johnson by sparking the rebellion with his resignation as finance minister in July. Those party members still loyal to Johnson are likely to put up fierce resistance to Sunak's aspiration. They don't mention the elephant in the room, which is he's half Indian. And I don't know, I haven't lived in the UK for many, many years. I only lived there for one year, 30 years ago. So I don't know the current pulse of the nation. Do they care? Do people not care about that anymore? Or, or do they? Do they look at him and go, can we get a white guy? I don't know whether that matters or not, but it's interesting that it's not mentioned whatsoever in the article. Another possibility is Penny Mordaunt. I'm probably mispronouncing her name. The former defense secretary came in third in the previous race with Bel Belfair. Is it Betfair? Oh, I guess it's Betfair. With Betfair suggesting she maintains the same position in the running behind Sunak. Mordaunt won plaudits for her performance in Parliament on Monday when she de defended the government even as it reversed its, most of its policies. One lawmaker has decide, described Mordaunt as having broad appeal, referring to her ability to find friends in the various tribes in the party. However, others are thought to be wary of taking a chance on an inexperienced candidate at a time of unprecedented troubles. I don't think they're going to pick anybody inexperienced. After what happened with Liz, they're not ready. I don't think the anybody wants to experiment. They want somebody that they have high confidence in, um, not somebody that's... I don't think they want an outsider right now. I think in the U.S. right now, we want as somebody who's an outsider to Washington. I think in the U.K., after this tremendous instability, they want to restore stability. They're not going to want a newbie. They're not going to want a newbie to the system. Jeremy Hunt, who's the current finance minister, this is the guy that Liz Truss brought in to kind of save everything, which is going to make him a front runner automatically, I think. If he's the one that was brought in to save things, then, and he did, and he stabilized the markets, people might say, well, let's go with this guy. He stabilized the markets, that's good, let's keep him. Tressa turned, Hunt to try, turned to Hunt to try to save her doomed economic policies, and now many believe his party will like, likewise look to him to take the helm. While he has been Treasury Chief for just three days, Hunt is seen as a safe bet given his vast experience, including spells as both health and foreign minister. Some lawmakers, in fact, had already started referring to Hunt as the real prime minister at the end of Tressa's time. That's what it seemed like. It seemed like for the past couple of days that he was actually in charge and restoring stability. As long as he doesn't annoy the right too much, he's in he's the obvious he's in the obvious position as front runner one former minister told Times of London. He's highly experienced and he has served at the highest level for a long time, which is not something that can be said of any of the other names uh, bandied around. However, Betfair only puts him in seventh place, likely because of his previous bids ending in disaster and in the last campaign Hunter's Hunt finished last of eight candidates on the first ballot with only 18 MPs supporting him. That's pretty bad. He pointed to those failures just days ago, suggesting they had ended, ended his leadership ambitions. So it looks like he's not really 
thinking of himself as being in the running. I think having run two leadership campaigns, and by the way, failed to both of them, the desire to be leader has been clinically excised from me. <laughs> he told the BBC on Sunday. That's funny. Boris Johnson. The quirky Big Apple born... Was he born in New York? Huh. The quirky Big Apple born journalist only grudgingly quit after a show of no confidence in July and has made no secret of his ongoing political ambitions. His supporters have been even more vocal, including former Culture Secretary Nadine Dorries, who on Wednesday said MPs must demand Bojo's return. Betmakers Betfair also has Johnson as the third favorite. However, political insiders believe he is far too great a risk to be voted back into office, especially as his scandals, including parties defying his own COVID lockdown policies, that was pretty bad. He's having a party at the same time he's telling people not to because of COVID, sparked the current leadership crisis. Some closest to him also say he is more interested in making money on the speech circuit than returning to frontline politics. Ben Wallace, I've never heard of this guy, Britain's current defense secretary is one of the few ministers to have emerged from recent political turmoil with his credibility enhanced. The former soldier was defense minister for both Johnson and Truss and has been praised for leading Britain's response to Russia's war in Ukraine. He has thought, well, and I don't like him. <laughs> you should be saying, don't go in Ukraine. Don't go. Just stay out of it. Stay the hell out of it. He is thought to be a popular choice among other party members, and at least one cabinet member is said to be lobbying hard on Wallace's behalf, according to the UK Times. However, others are wary of his lack of experience with the economy, the biggest issue that forced trust from power. I, I think they're going to want somebody who can stabilize the economy, so I'm not sure they're going to go for this guy. Wallace also surprised many earlier this year when he said he wouldn't run for the leadership, telling the UK Times he wanted to keep his current defense job until I finish. So I think based on what's written in here and kind of my own analysis of they want somebody who's going to stabilize the economy, I think we're probably looking at either Boris Johnson or uh, the first guy, Rishi Sunak. So it, it might be Rishi. It might be um, the Indian dude. All right, let's look at some of the comments we've got here. I'm sure lots of people have many, many things to say. Jim, as author, says Johnson just announced he would not be the candidate. And I would say maybe he'll change his mind, but there's not a lot of time left. They're going to be doing this next week. If he doesn't want to run, he doesn't want to run. Jim, as author, says Sunex uh, sounds like a Vulcan name is the World Economic Forum pick, which means he'll win. You got a good point. Um, if they, well, wasn't... Uh, wasn't Liz Truss also a favorite of the World Economic Forum? Maybe you can't get that far in politics anymore if you're not, or maybe it's really hard to do so. Corn says, ahead of letters beat her. Yeah, I read that whole thing. <laughs> okay, so uh, not everybody's going to know about this because I just uh, heard about it a couple hours ago. Somebody put on, I guess, YouTube or somewhere on uh, social media that they thought the lettuce would last longer than Liz Truss. In other words... She would be out of office before the lettuce went bad, before it rotted, and it did. The lettuce la lasted longer than she did. And it wasn't in the refrigerator or anything. It was just kind of sitting out there. So the lettuce beater. Adam Scott says, Sunak might be tough on grooming gangs due to being Indian. Huh. Also, if I remember correctly, India is always rated the most racist country on earth. It is. There have been, there've been studies. Uh, I think the study that I read, the question that they asked people was, would it bother you if somebody of a different race moved next door to you? And the country that had the most resounding, where they asked a lot of people, the most resounding, yes, that would bother me if somebody of a different race moved next to me, it was India. They had the biggest issue with that. So India won the prize as the most racist country in the world. Uh... Brian Banner says, that's a whole lot of doomed for one article. <laughs> yeah, there's, um, I mean, there's, there's no obvious person or that obvious person would have beaten Liz Trust six weeks ago. So if the person you wanted was a disaster and she beat everybody else, what are you going to do about that? I don't know. They're not in a good position right now. Uh, let's look over here on entropy. I didn't mean to uh, 
uh, there you go. Altman helps me. It's pronounced exchequer, exchequer. I just, I have trouble with that word, exchequer. Because I want to want to, I always want to put more syllables in it. And I, I can't. Ogwin says, my mom used to think that Chuck E. Cheese was the perfect place to abduct a child. Loud, lots of kids that don't want to leave, and their parent has to drag them out. Yes, whenever I took my kids to Chuck E. Cheese, uh, I would let them go and play, but I would sit in the booth, and I always made sure I was facing the exit so that I could see if if they were leaving or someone was trying to take them and the um, exit in the back had an alarm on it so I always made sure I was facing the exit so either I was sitting there watching the exit or I was watching the kids one or the other I Elva Kira says Laurel you should have told me you were running way sooner I'm one of two people who know how an election here in the 90s was run the incumbent was defeated of 65 percent to 35 percent in the primary we actually didn't have primaries for this it's technically a non-party position but I say in my answers to the questions I mentioned being a libertarian twice I wasn't trying to associate with a party but I'm just like this is my political philosophy so I threw it out there excuse me because one of the questions was do you support defunding the police and I said this is where I differ from a lot of hardcore libertarians is I actually think we need the police I think we have to have police so a lot of libertarians think we don't need police at all and I'm like yeah I think we need the police so I mentioned it in there but I said that well I think we need them and I respect them and uh, support the police. I don't lionize them. And they are, their budget is as vulnerable to potential cuts as anybody else's. Uh, Tom Tom says, Johnson pulled out of the race a couple hours ago. So Rishi Sunak is looking very likely to be coronated as prime minister. Uh, probably, I think a lot of people are, they may bite the bullet and said, okay, we'll put the Indian in charge. They, they just want to rescue the economy, and uh, they may do it. Um, Tom Tom says, if Sunak remains the only candidate to get the required 100 supporters, he will be declared the winner. No one would have voted for him, neither the voters nor even the party membership. Mm -hmm. Elva Caro, the Fed isn't doing all it needs to do to flight, fight inflation. It is, however, doing all it needs to do to destroy the EU and Davos. Yeah, and uh, this is what I mean about uh, Liz Truss made some mistakes. I, I think her biggest mistake was not really reading the current environment. Um, but a lot of what sunk her was she was kind of in a no-win situation. And I think the next person will be as well. So we'll see. I didn't mention that last week. Whoever steps in to try to save their national economy is going to fail. I don't care what country it is. I don't care what the plan is. I don't care who it is. I don't think anybody's economy can be saved right near right now unless you are an agricultural society that has high net exports then you're probably going to be okay. And there's not many countries that meet that uh, description. One of them is actually Brazil. Brazil might actually do okay in this global crisis. Uh, they may suffer a little bit, but they may do better than most other countries because Brazil, Brazil is a net exporter of food and it's a big one. Um, and same with a couple of the other uh, South American countries. Now, their governments are a mess, so they can they can still self-destruct but is it possible for them to come out on top yes yes because there's a global food shortage and they are major food producers so we'll see but at all the other countries any country in europe any country in asia just about maybe thailand might be okay because they're a major major rice producer but all the other ones like you you can't save it the the global economy is going down it is a sinking ship and you're not by yourself going to be able to save it. You can't do it. And by yourself, I mean your country, by your country self. No matter how hard you try, you're not going to be able to save it. We'll all get through to the other side, but not without um, experiencing major economic woes. Like, like major, major. 
Uh, back over to YouTube. Just a couple more and then we'll, we'll get back over. Thermopylae says, Chuck E. Cheese hit on my sister. <laughs> and followed us out to the parking lot. It was creepy. <laughs> How old was your sister? I hope she wasn't a kid. <laughs> Kyle Glenn says, police are for, for when we go to sleep. So one of the things that are, that's happening right now in this town is the village council has gone a little crazy with the ordinances. There's way too many ordinances and they are sending the police out to enforce the ordinances. So when the police come to your house, and this didn't happen to us, it happened to somebody down the street. I kid you not. I kid you not, the police came to this guy's house down the street and told him he had too many cars in his driveway. He can't park his own cars in his own driveway. It's his driveway, they're his cars. They're not parked in the street. They're not parked in the yard. They're, they're not blocking the sidewalk. There actually isn't a sidewalk there. Yeah, there isn't one. They're not blocking anything. They're his cars in his driveway. And the police came, the police, to tell him he had too many cars in his driveway. Okay, so the ordinance is wrong. And the police are bored. If the police have time for that, like the police are supposed to be too busy for that sort of thing. If somebody's violated an ordinance, you send them a letter. You don't send the police to tell somebody to mow their grass. You don't send the police to tell somebody he needs to paint his house because his paint is peeling. That happened to somebody else we talked to. It's gotten out of control. The police are bored. We have too many police. Uh, over here, and I'm, I'm not making any of this up. Like the reporter, when the reporter called, she wanted to talk to us a couple minutes about our questions. And she is the one who actually told us about the peeling paint story. She said her dad had some peeling paint on the outside of his house and he was actually getting ready to uh, repaint his house. And um, within a couple of days, and the police came and told him that it was an ordinance violation for him to have peeling paint and he had to, he had to fix it. The, the police came because his paint is peeling. What? It's insane. It has gotten, it's gotten crazy. So we actually want to cut down on the number of police because clearly they don't have enough to do and we shouldn't be paying people to be bored and go around and tell people to mow their lawn or paint their house. That's not what police are supposed to be for. Um, over here on, I just wanted to visit on Rumble. Nobody's over on Rumble right now. So let me copy this. I want to make sure everybody has the address in case, um, just for the day, when I, I get a strike on YouTube, because it's going to happen, it's going to happen, and, um, and I, can't, uh, I can't do my live stream for a week. Um, Elvacara says, so your village council is also your HOA. They are acting like an HOA. And this is part of, this was another reason that uh, got me, that Matt convinced me that we needed to run, because they came in and told us to mow our lawn. And we're like, seriously? And it wasn't so much that I didn't think we needed to mow the lawn, we did. It was, really, you sent the police? You, you sent the police to tell us to mow the lawn? Really? So, it's gotten out of control. Alrighty, let's move on to the next story. The title of tonight's show is U.S. Navy Admiral Warns China May Try to Take Taiwan by the End of 2022. So, well, first let's go over what's happening in China. Now, we knew, everybody knew, that China, um, Xi Jinping, was getting ready to be installed for a third term. I hear Matt. I might have to. I might have to close my door because he's. I think he's playing my show. So we're about to get feedback. Honey, my door is open. Just FYI, uh, the Xi Jinping has just been installed for a third term. Now we knew this was going to happen. I. But it's still important. I chose this report because this reporter actually had a few tidbits of information that I didn't know about regarding Xi Jinping getting rid of some of his political adversaries in the highest positions. So he has solidified his power by getting rid of some of the people he didn't like and putting in people he did like. And she's gonna comment on that in a minute here. It was very much expected, but nonetheless, that still doesn't take away from the fact this is a huge moment in history, a massively significant moment for the Communist Party, for President Xi himself, but for China and the world uh, as well. 
it is breaking with precedent for him to be appointed for another five-year term. He's been in power for 10 years here. And according to precedent going back decades, that would mean it's time for him to step down, that it's somebody else's term. But no, he will serve at least another five-year term. And there is nothing now to prevent him from going on uh, to be leader uh, for life. It's worth saying a two-term limit for Chinese leaders was introduced back in the early 80s in the wake of the death of Chairman Mao, but back in 2018, she successfully removed that two-term limit from the Constitution, paving the way um, for the situation that we've seen today. Okay, so what she just said was, there used to be a two-term limit that was introduced in the 80s, but back in 2018, I remember reading about it then, he actually got rid of that rule. And it was at that time when Xi Jinping got rid of the rule that you can only have two terms, and a lot of people were saying he plans to make himself chairman for life. And that seems to be what's happening. As part of that event that just concluded within the last hour, we also saw a revelation of Xi's new top team, what's called the Politburo Standing Committee. So essentially the six most powerful uh, men in China after him. And actually the personnel on that team tells us all sorts of very, very interesting things as well. Uh, previously, in the previous five years, there were characters on that team who were not from the same wing uh, of the party of President Xi. Uh, we wouldn't call them necessarily rivals because it's uh, you know, a very sort of tightly controlled system, but they certainly uh, weren't considered to be staunch Xi allies. Those people, even though, were young, even though they were young enough to serve another term, they've gone. Uh, they've been replaced by four new faces, all of whom come from Xi's very close circle. So there really is a sense of him stuffing that top team with his close allies, perhaps another hint of that real consolidation of power, this path that President Xi is taking China on is a path that is here to stay. And it is a path that has seen China become very much richer, very much stronger, very much more assertive and powerful on the international stage. But a lot of that has been achieved through significantly heightened controls here in China. And certainly for the international community, uh, noises about the invasion of potential uh, invasion of Taiwan, something that will worry them uh, in in the speech that President Xi gave, he talked about choppy waters and a coming storm. So there will be analysis into some of those words as well. But certainly a very historic day here for China and for the rest of the world. Yeah, so I, I mean, I agree with so much of what she said. She said that um, with him solidifying power and getting this third term, uh, we can expect more of the same. And he's probably going to be a little emboldened at this point in his victory speech he talked about reuniting china meaning going after taiwan and he also taught told people that there's there's a storm ahead it's clear that he plans to move forward with with um getting taiwan back as i said in previous episodes I think that what he plans to do, I'm not the only one who thinks this, is that he's going to do an embargo around Taiwan. He effectively tried it out, did kind of a practice run earlier this year for a couple of weeks. And so we know pretty much what he's going to do and he's ready to do it at any time. He could start doing it tomorrow. We don't know. And this was one of the, th well, okay, let me talk about Japan first. Japan is taking this very, very seriously. This is from Ford Observer. Go ahead and take a drink. This is from the Forward Observer website <clears throat> commenting on uh, Japan's military expansion. Now, as I mentioned earlier, in regard to the U.S. Fed chairman trying to prop up the U.S. dollar against other currencies, is it's actually really damaging the, China, the, um, <laughs> the Japanese yen, not just the British pound, and also a number of other currencies. So they have been suffering from the yen losing some value, which is making their economic problems worse. And in a previous uh, live stream several weeks ago, I talked about the debt to GDP ratio. And actually the first world country that has the biggest issue with this is Japan. They're actually very deep in debt. So right now with the yen losing value with the whole world experiencing inflation not this not just the u.s with a lot of economic problems that they're having in japan right now and their high debt to gdp ratio there was some talk that maybe they're going to have to scrap their plans to expand their military but the head of japan's ruling party 
is not scrapping the plants. And this, I think, communicates how dire and urgent the situation is. That Japan is like, we have to invest in military. And it's almost as though they're saying, this is imminent. We have to do this now. We have to spend the money. I don't care if you think we don't have the money. We have to do this. That is how serious this is. That it's not just some analysts like uh, making sort of outlandish claims about what is to come. Like they, they wouldn't be doing this if it was an outside possibility. So reading this, Japan committed to military expansion despite economic woes. The head of Japan's ruling Liberal Democratic Party uh, tax, oh, I see. The head of Japan's ruling Liberal Democratic Party tax policy panel said on Monday that Japan will boost military spending and may ra raise corporate and income taxes to pay for it. Japan is facing military threats from China and North Korea, and at the same time, public debt is double the size of the economy. That's what I was talking about, about the debt to GDP ratio. With little room left for financial maneuvering ahead of what could be a global financial crisis, the LDP has charted a path of unpopular tax hikes combined with spending cuts in non-essential programs to prepare for what it believes will be a near-term military conflict in the region. Near-term meaning this is going to happen real soon. And they're putting their money where their analysis is. They're like, we have to spend this money. Uh, along these lines, there is a U.S. Navy admiral who was talking to a think tank and he's saying this thing with Taiwan, this may happen by the end of the year. The end of this year, maybe early 2023, but it, it could happen by the end of the year and we need to be ready for that. This is from International Business Times. It's also appeared in another number of other places. The U.S. must prepare now for China invasion of Taiwan, says the admiral. I think invasion, let's it, it's not necessarily going to be Brit oh, British, oh man, I can't think tonight, Chinese ships landing on Taiwan's shores. I, uh, at first, I think it's going to be an embargo first until Taiwan relents. And basically, they'll surrender, Taiwan will surrender before any Chinese ships actually land on uh, Taiwan shores. So invasion is that an invasion in some ways, but not in the traditional sense of the word invasion. Uh, and the, well, let's go on here. The U.S. military must be ready to respond to a potential invasion of Taiwan as soon as this year, a senior admiral said Wednesday, signaling heightened alarm over Beijing's intentions toward the island. Admiral Michael Gilday, Chief of U.S. Naval Operations, is the latest senior official in Washington to raise concerns that China's President Xi Jinping may be much more willing than previously thought to seize Taiwan. His comments came as Taiwan's top security official warned any attempt to invade the island would fail and turn China into an international pariah. I don't think China is worried about being a pariah. Xi is on the cusp of securing it. Well, he's done it now. Xi is on the cusp of securing a third five-year term at the helm of the world's most populous nation, delivering a landmark Communist Party speech, Party Congress speech on Sunday, where he restated his vow to one day reunify or forcefully take Japan, Japan, or Taiwan, and Japan. <laughs> he probably is. Japan's really worried about it. So, after they get Taiwan, they may be coming after Japan. In a discussion, but that wasn't part of his speech. Uh, Xi Jinping didn't talk about Japan in his speech. He only talked about Taiwan. In a discussion with a think tank, Gede was asked about Xi's speech and whether he agreed with comments by another U.S. admiral that Beijing would be ready to take Taiwan by 2027. Quote, it's not just what President, President Xi says. It's how the Chinese behave and what they do, Gilday told the Atlantic Council. And what we've seen over the past 20 years is that they have delivered on every promise they've made. Okay, let me read this again. What we've seen over the past 20 years is that they have delivered on every promise they've made earlier than they said they were going to deliver on it. So when we talk about the 2027 window, in my mind, that has to be a 2022 window or potentially 2023 window, he added. Uh, 
I can't rule that out. And I don't mean to be alarmist by saying that. It's just that we can't wish that away. Eventually, they're going to do it. When is eventually? Is eventually in one year, five years, 2027, 2030, Christmas? They're, they're going to do it. And I think they're going to do it sooner rather than later. Because I think Xi Jinping is going to want to do this while Biden is in office because Biden is so inept. So it's going to happen soon. All right, let's look at some of the comments that we got. Uh, Fiery Waco, Laurel, do you mean China would blockade Taiwan because an embargo is just a ban on trade? Uh, fair enough. Uh, blockade. Blockade and make sure, well, make sure that they don't get any um, uh, goods going back and forth. Blockade is a better word for it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Shits and Giggles, Laurel, I'm pretty sure you'll get your boog, <laughs> but I think it'd be more like what we're envisioning it to be when we were growing up. You more like a big kinetic war? I, I don't know. I don't know what it's going to look like. Charles McGowan, she knows Biden will be impeached and removed next year. He will move before that happens. That is a very, uh, that's a very good point. That if there is a red wave, which is likely in this November 8th election, then there's a pretty good chance that Biden is going to be impeached and removed from office for some quid pro quo activities in Ukraine and with Saudi Arabia, telling Saudi Arabia, hey, just uh, increase production until after the elections and we won't uh, sanction you. That's a quid pro quo and that's illegal. He can't be doing that. Because it's for his benefit or the benefit of his party, not for the benefit of the country. That's why. Um, I was going to read some. Oh, yeah. Uh, Black Magic says, YouTube is asshole. Fuck YouTube. Yes, I agree. Rick Bourne says, Japan needs to start making nukes. I bet they already have. JDG, I don't blame China for getting tired of being baited by the neocon globalists that control America, same as Russia was. I... I sort of see China as taking advantage of the globalists. I think Putin is very much against them and wants to stop them. I think Xi Jinping th thinks maybe we can use them. Maybe we can manipulate them. Um, I just, I don't know. I don't know what makes me think that. Maybe that's just out from left field and just throwing that out there. But the feeling I get is that Xi Jinping is like, we can use them. And um, Putin is like, we need to destroy them. I don't know. I don't know. I, I can't really put my finger on where that's coming from. So take it with a grain of salt. Over here on Entropy, mandatory carry, $5. Thank you. I can't stay, but hashtag keep fighting. Build that bag. Hashtag nine or seven is coming. Uh, nine or one seven is coming. Iran created the bug and there are four lights. Hashtag we love you, Susan. Hashtag you cut. <laughs> that's awesome. James McDaniel, this is freedom versus communism. Everything else is in between. Elvacaro, Japan could be a nuclear power in a time period best measured in weeks. I bet they already are. I bet Japan, I wonder if you could do it without other countries finding out. I wonder. Uh, Altman says, China is a patronage society. Rewards and promote those loyal to you. That's the way it works. Mm-hmm. Elvacaro, you say CCP, I say Xi Dynasty. The CCP isn't actually commie, it's fascist. James McDaniel says, never be fooled, China is a communist, as it can be. Eh, it's kind of a mix. I don't know. Elvacaro, China's garbage property rights are still better than any commie country w would have. These, they're fascists masquerading as commies. Uh, China's China. Oh, wow. Over here on uh, um, Rumble, people are talking up a storm. Rational Wrong Think says the boo will be a civil war involving libtards, the enemy who've been uh, allowed into our countries from the CCP and jihadi groups, in my humble opinion. Rational Wrong Think, Fetterman's neck is pregnant. <laughs> it's giving birth to a wanker. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, there's probably people from other country go countries going, who's Fetterman? Fetterman is running for Senate in Pennsylvania. 
Um, and he has some sort of growth on his neck. He's really, he had a stroke not too long ago and he, I think, was hiding from the public how severe the damage was from the stroke. I, I feel bad for him, but he should step down He sh from, from the race. He should exit the race. He's not fit to serve as a senator. He's just, there's too much brain damage. And it's, it's heartbreaking. I feel sorry for him, but he shouldn't be running. Sorry. You're going to have to drop out. You're no longer medically fit to serve. Alrighty. Let's look at what is happening in Ukraine. Now, the reason I think it's significant to talk about this is Russia is now attacking Ukraine's power grid. A couple of years ago, they did a test run of cyber, they being Russia, did a test run of cyber attacks against the Ukrainian power grid. And they did bring it down temporarily for a part of it. Excuse me, it was one of the most significant cyber attacks ever on a power grid. But now they are attacking the physical infrastructure of the power grid. And I think that this is significant because I see this as kind of a uh, harbinger of what is to come for other countries as we get into, I think likely at this point, more kinetic war rather than just sort of cold war or economic war. We're going to start throwing missiles and stuff at each other. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot more directly attacking the power grid. Um, the reports are that Russia is attacking the power grid and the water system in Ukraine, leaving people without power or water. This is, I think, what we're going to see a lot more of in wars. And not only wars between nations, but also civil wars, which is what I've been talking about before. And the reason that it just seems like the obvious target is because we are all in modern society so dependent on electricity. We are so dependent on electricity that this was bound to happen. When we see what's going on in Ukraine, just keep that in mind that if Russia is attacking Ukraine's power grid, it's because that's an obvious target and it's not just going to be an obvious target in Ukraine. It's going to be an obvious target everywhere as we see first uh, first and second world is there still a second world first and second world nations battling each other is they're going to try to take out each other's power grid a day after russia launched airstrikes in multiple ukrainian cities at rush hour the country's president volodymyr zelensky is now saying that 30 percent of ukraine's power stations have been destroyed in just over a week causing widespread blackouts across the country in what appears to be a deliberate campaign by Moscow to destroy electricity and water facilities before winter. That includes new Russian airstrikes on Tuesday morning. Smoke was seen on the Kiev skyline and explosions in an area where there is a thermal power station. The mayor reported an attack on what he called critical infrastructure, although officials have not confirmed if the station was hit. Strikes have also left the northern city of Zhitomir, home to 263,000 people, without water and electricity supply. And, according to a Ukrainian presidential aide, two explosions rocked an energy facility in Dnipro, a southeastern city of nearly one million, causing serious damage. Attacking infrastructure is nothing new for war. And uh, attacking power stations, I'm sure that happened. I, I'm not a um, World War II aficionado, but I'm sure that was a big part of it, was attacking power stations. The difference now is how dependent we are on electricity. So this is the future of war is the lights are going to go out. And we're, we're not used to living that way. We don't know, we as a, a country, as a society, um, all, of, all of the first world uh, no longer knows how to live without electricity for the long term. We can do it for a couple of days. If you're thinking, oh, well, we've had blackouts before. Yeah, a day or two, maybe a week. But this would be very, very long term. And um, this is just an indicator, what they're doing in Russia, that that's how it's going to be. On a related note, talking about energy, the president, in his infinite wisdom, is releasing more of the strategic oil reserves. And he is doing this, I'm sure, because there is an election coming up. Now, the what he's promising to release at this moment 
is actually stuff that's going to be released later this year. He had already committed to releasing a lot of oil in uh, October. So what, what is being released right now was what he promised before. But he is now releasing more of it. Where are the U.S. strategic oil reserves? Here's how many barrels remain and where they are. This is an article from USA Today. Biden announced plans to release 15 million barrels from the U.S. strategic oil reserves. Where are the oil reserves stored and how long will they last? <clears throat> President Joe Biden announced Wednesday, this is from a few days ago, that he's releasing 15 million barrels of oil from the nation's emergency reserves. This will complete the six-month draw down of 180 million barrels that Biden ordered in March. Between March 4th and October 14th, the U.S. released 172.4 million barrels. Okay, I got to make this a little smaller. USA Today had some really great graphs. This is a graph of what's going on with our strategic oil reserve. Now you can see that back in 1982, which was 40 years ago, it was down to, the strategic oil reserve was down to 270 million. Currently it is at 405 million barrels. Now the last time it was at this level <clears throat> was in 1984, which was what, 30, 38 years ago? Yeah, 38 years ago was the last time it was this low. And we had a much smaller population back then. So if you look at barrels of oil per person, it's actually much, much lower than that. We got to a high of 726 million back in 2010, but this is, you know, we worked really hard as a country to build it up. We build it up really high in the, the mid 2000s or 2010. And then now just a very steep drop off. And I think he plans to just keep releasing the strategic oil reserves, I think it's just going to keep releasing it until it's gone. And then what are we going to do? Then what are we going to do? You can't just keep, it's going to, it's finite. It's finite. Now he's released what? Uh, let me see. About a third of it looks like maybe a little over a third since Biden started releasing it. So it's not going to last forever. You keep going at this rate, it's going to be gone in another year. Uh, I thought this is, they had a lot of graphs in this article. I thought all the graphs are great. Good for USA Today. They make really good graphs. I appreciate a good graph. This is the graph of how much the different countries of the world produce in terms of, um, let me see if I can move this, in terms of how much oil they produce. And I have talked before about the U.S. being number one. Why won't this go? Go down here. There, that's better. Now it should be, oh, come on. I'm trying to fix this so I can make it bigger. Okay, move that back down. All right, oh, there we go, got it. Um, I wanna show you this. Sorry I'm messing around with it. Duct tape production. This is how much the different countries produce in terms of oil. You, as you can see, the United States way out in number one. Usually the US, Saudi Arabia, and Russia are neck and neck. But the U.S. has stepped up production. Saudi Arabia and Russia have cut it back. So right now we are at almost 19 million barrels. Saudi Arabia at about 11. Russia at about 11. Usually we're, we're neck and neck. But if you look at this, the next country down is Canada. Canada is, Canada is actually a major oil producer. And uh, it's half of what Russia or Saudi Arabia currently is in terms of how much they produce. It's 5.5 million. The next one is China. Now China produces almost 5 million barrels, but China uses it all and then some. So they're not an exporter. Uh, Iraq, UAE. So all these other countries, uh, there's some, you know, a handful of countries that, that produce a respectable amount, but it's really the US, Saudi Arabia, and Russia, which are way out in front of, in, in front of everybody else. So that gives you an idea of what's going on when Saudi Arabia and Russia collude to cut how much oil is being produced. That really has a big impact. Okay, let's look at some of the comments before we go on to the next story. All this stuff about energy. Um, let's look at uh, uh, Rumble. Russia, wrong thing has to leave. Oh, well, good morning. I was going to say good night, but I guess it's good morning for you here and I'll show you. Russia Run thing says the U.S. only has a couple weeks worth of diesel left. I did not know that. I'll have to um, I'll have to do a little bit of fact checking on that one. 
But if the U.S. only has a couple of diesel uh, weeks of diesel left, that's a big deal because our trucks run on diesel. Most of the trucks around the country that bring our goods into the cities, they run on diesel. On entropy, Altman says Republican Senate majority won't be large enough to impeach Biden on their own. I think there's going to be some people may cross the line. We'll see. We'll see. Altman says Biden is clearly trying to keep the prices down as much as possible through midterms. No Saudis involved. Elva Caro, this just means that if a civil war pops off, the military is going to have much less room to breathe. Most oil production is in red zones on the map. Yeah, well, most of the country is in red zones. It's really just the cities on the coasts that aren't. And the cities have a lot of population in them, but most of the country is red territory. Uh, most of the uh, geographically. I think the population is just slightly more than half in the blue territories, but they're, they're small spaces. James McDaniel, the weapon is not a machine gun, but Marxism-Leninism. Mal, Mal said that. The weapon is not a machine gun, but Marxism-Leninism. Okay, let's look at YouTube, and then I will go on to the next story. Black Magic says, Laurel, did you miss my super chat on Rumble? Was there a super chat? See, they do things differently over here. I don't know whether I did. Let me see if I can go up. They do things differently here, so it might be... Oh, there we go. I see it. Black Magic, $5. Step one, work all the hours. Step two, sweep all the chimneys. Step three, make all the monies. Step four, buy Quebec <laughs> and make them speak American English. <laughs> that sounds good. By the way, the largest population of French Canadians residing in the U.S. reside in New Hampshire. It is, there's actually a lot. Okay, let's go on to the next thing, which is, well, speaking of Canada, that's a good lead-in to what's going on in Canada. And I'm really sorry that this is happening over there. Talk about authoritarian government. Things in Canada just got really, really bad. It is no longer legal to buy, sell, or transfer a handgun in Canada. The federal government's national handgun freeze is now in effect. The Prime Minister saying fewer guns mean safer communities as Ottawa moves forward on its plan to limit access to firearms. In May, the Liberals announced a plan to implement a freeze on the importation, purchase and sale of handguns. The number of handguns in Canada has increased by 70% since 2010. Since 2011, firearms-related homicides have gone up nearly 40% and handguns were the most commonly used weapon. Okay, so let's think about this. Crime is going up dramatically. The government isn't, isn't stopping it, obviously. The people say, we have to do something to protect ourselves. And the government's response is, no, you can't protect yourself. What? Trudeau says with handgun violence on the rise, urgent action is needed to remove these deadly weapons from communities. The freeze announced at the same time as Bill C-21, a gun control act, is still being debated in the House of Commons. If passed, it will see gun licenses revoked for people committing domestic violence or engaged in criminal harassment and increase the maximum penalties for gun smuggling to 14 years in prison, up from 10. We don't believe in just picking one lane when it comes to solving this complex problem. You need smart laws. You need sensible laws. Public Safety Minister Marco Mendicino says the handgun freeze will give law enforcement the additional tools they need to tackle organized crime networks involved in the trafficking of handguns and illegal firearms. Okay, so tell me how many of the guns used in those homicides were purchased legally. There's probably some. There's probably some of the guns used in the homicides that were purchased legally. I bet, this is how it is in the U.S., most of them weren't. So changing these gun laws so that law-abiding citizens can't get them, that's just going to make it worse. All right, let's see what we've got over here. 
uh, on YouTube. I'm sure people have a lot to say about gun stuff. Black Magic on YouTube says Vermont is a close second. Vermont equals Vermont. Green Mountains at Kyle Glen, New Hampshire has just always had a better economy. So the frogs come here. You know why New Hampshire has a better economy? Because they don't have very good uh, social support. Vermont has great social support, which is why the economy is better in New Hampshire. Stephen Roberts, GevoCore Biojet Fuel, recently received a second large grant from U.S. government, the USG. I know, is that just U.S. government or there's something else for the G? Don't know if it's more voodoo green energy, but might be a game changer. I don't know about that. Rick Bourne says cities with a high population den density are most vulnerable to utility attacks and distribution problems as the population there is not self-sufficient as necessities, uh, uh, as to necessities at all. Yes. Um, also, people in the cities, they are vulnerable to blockade, as we discussed earlier. Not an embargo, but a blockade, because uh, I got the word wrong as it has been pointed out. E's only ones and twos. Laurel, did you see Matt's story on ATF Mountie collusion? I have, you know what, uh, my boyfriend Matt mentioned earlier to me, to, to me earlier today, that he hasn't been playing video games lately because he's too busy with our homestead. Since we started homesteading, his video game playing has dropped off significantly and his YouTube watching has dropped off significantly. And I said the same thing. I do not watch nearly as many YouTube videos as I used to from anybody. So even the number of Matt Christensen videos that I watch, I used to watch every single one and now I catch maybe, I still do the live stream on Sunday night. I don't do the Wednesday stream. I used to never miss that one. And now I, barely wa I rarely watch one of his pre-recorded videos. I got too much stuff to do. I, I just, I don't have time. So no, I did not see it because uh, I do my show and I do the work that I need to do to make money. And then the rest of the time at Homestead. It's just right now I've got like homesteading I did today. I've got a bunch. I, I cut. I had freeze. Not freeze dried. Dehydrated a bunch of chives. So I prepped those today. And then I started dehydrating a bunch of thyme. So I, were, I started that out. And stuff Matt did today. Like he's working on the chicken coops and everything. We're just super busy with that stuff. So we don't have time to watch this anymore. So no, unfortunately, I, I, I haven't seen it. Uh, let's see. Uh, and then also we have this election, which I need to get back to pretty soon. Alkman said, anybody want to bet on how much the handgun ban will help Canada? I'm betting on a net of 0% or less. Yeah, I do not think it will help at all. Um, I've got two stories left. One of them is a little hard to listen to because it's about treasury bonds, but let's instead go to another video that I have, which is about the, uh, the new prime minister of Italy. Now this clip that I'm going to show you was done during her election a couple of weeks ago. Subsequent to this video, she won the election and she is actually, over the past few days, she was installed as the new Prime Minister of Italy. But I really like this clip because it gives you an idea of what she's all about. It's heartening that she won and hopefully we'll see more people like her in Europe. And maybe if there's enough people like her, I don't think anybody can avert the coming financial crisis, as I previously said. But we will all most of us some of us will live through it and there will be an other side that we get to and we need to start thinking about what's going to happen when we get to the other side this is the kind of person that I think we need Giorgia Meloni is taking the stage the 45 year old is considered charismatic smart and dangerous and she knows just what her base wants to hear she immediately goes on the offensive she accuses the left of being aggressive and calls the EU incapable of tackling the energy crisis. And she claims Italy's last administration abandoned the people, but that she'll always put Italians first. Let me explain our stance on migration. They've told you lots of nonsense about it. Wait for them with a shotgun. No, wait, I don't agree with that. <laughs> The right-wing nationalist strives to appear moderate, 
but she quickly makes clear what she wants. She'd like to see a more heavy-handed approach to immigrants from the global south. They cause security issues. But you can't get the lefties to wrap their heads around that. They show solidarity with women who've been attacked as long as they aren't attacked by illegal immigrants. Because then suddenly the illegal immigrant is more important than the rape victim. Many of her fans can't get enough of her straight talk. It doesn't seem to bother anyone here that many people in Meloni's party are supporters of former dictator Benito Mussolini, or that the flame on his tomb is her party symbol. Now, I, as I previously discussed in this episode, I, I'm a libertarian, uh, or at least I lean libertarian, and fascists are, are very, very uh, authoritarian, so that would be opposite. But some of the other things that she's saying are, are things that need to be said, and we need people in power who understand those things. All right, we got just a couple minutes left. I'm going to skip the last story. Well, let me just very, very quickly, because I, I was going to go over it and everything, but um, basically... There is an inversion in the yield curve for treasury yields, and usually when it inverts, and the ones that are longer term actually have a lower yield than the ones that are short term, because usually it's the other way around. When it inverts like that, that is usually a sign of an imminent recession. Now, not every single time, because I looked up, I was looking for articles on this, and it actually did happen near the beginning of 2019. We didn't have a recession in the beginning of 2019. We learned about COVID at the very end of 2019 in December. So we, did, we had the recession afterwards. But usually, when it inverts like this, that means the recession is upon us. So I actually think we're already in a recession, but this is a sign of a significantly worsening economic situation that these two have inverted. Okay, let's go and look at some of the comments and then we will wrap things up. Larry Rapshaw, ain't got time for that. No, no can do, ain't got time for that. Got time, for oh, you're talking about time. <laughs> yeah, that I have some time in the uh, dehydrator. There's always, there's not enough time jokes. Like really, I could make some, but I don't, I don't want to. Robert Johnson, maybe we don't know what fascism is. Maybe we don't. Maybe they're just using the word fascist to mean anybody who is right of Bernie Sanders. Um, that's very uh, likely. Fabio Waco says, that's an il duce I can sink my teeth into. Mike Bergman, the other side is either slavery or complete ground zero. It's, oh, when we get to the other side of this crisis either slavery or complete ground zero. It's crazy we're not doing more. Well, Matt and I are trying. We're running for local office. I, is that going to solve it? No. Well, if all of us did, if all of us ran for local office, that would certainly be a very good start. Um, <laughs> he's only ones and twos. Benito did nothing wrong. A couple more comments here. Entropy. Uh, Alkman says just what the base wants to hear and immediately goes on the offensive. Sounds like what the rights bases, uh, base is like here as well. Yes, they, these are quotes from what we're just wa watching. The base in Italy, very much like the base in the United States. That we, we want, we, lo and behold, we want what's best for our families. How about that? We want what's best for our country and our families. Uh, Elva Caro, Africa is vulnerable to famines that could see hundreds of millions try to move to Europe. Oh, absolutely. That, that is a massive, massive disaster about to happen. About to happen. Because uh, Africa, extremely vulnerable to famine. They, they're going to have massive, massive famines. All right. Uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up right now. It was a really good, because I'm trying to end at, at 8.45 these days instead of at um, 8.50, just to give me a little extra time. Because I, I was trying to end it all at 8.50, and then I just had a bunch of things that I needed to do between this and when uh, the Matt and Blonde show start it starts, and I was never getting it done on time, and I was always coming in late. And I like to watch, I like to watch it live. And I like to see the first couple of minutes. I like the intro. All right, so I'm wrapping it up. Um, I should be having my next week's show on time as usual. And I will give you all updates on the election. We won't have the results yet, obviously. But I will give you updates on what's going on. 
when is Halloween? Halloween is the Monday. Okay, so next week is the 30th, not Halloween. Halloween would be the next day. So, but I will give you some um, update elections, uh, election updates. <laughs> I think it's time for me to end the show. On that night, uh, on that note, man, I just can't talk. On that note, uh, good show tonight. Have a good night, you guys, and I will see you next week.